Welcome to Biz Help For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. But there always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here's your host, Candy Messer. Hello and welcome to Biz Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the information on our last episode, Scaling to be a Visionary, informative. If you are unable to join us and would like to listen to the show, links can be found on our YouTube and Facebook pages, as well as multiple favorite podcast platforms. If you'd like to receive notifications on when our podcasts have been uploaded, please like and subscribe. And if there are topics you'd find beneficial or questions you have, please feel free to reach out to me at media at abandp.com. Now let's learn a little bit about our guest today. Chandler started his entrepreneurial journey after graduating from the University of Nevada, Reno with a degree in biochemistry and foregoing a medical pathway to pursue a brick and mortar wellness facility. He then pivoted to an online health practice a year before the COVID lockdowns. After scaling both businesses to the seven-figure level and doing 3,000 to 4,000 sales consultations, Chandler was frustrated with the way sales were taught. He was tired of the old school objection handling, aggressive tactics, and salesy attitude taught by most sales trainers. So he looked back at what he was doing, combed through his notes, and created Compassion Conversations, a therapeutic-driven, psychological-based sales system centered around compassion and care. Chandler has taught over 3,000 people his system of Compassion Conversations and has the goal to change and redefine the landscape of sales altogether. So Chandler, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Excited to show people that it's possible to sell without manipula- manipulation, aggressive tactics, or just really feeling salesy. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a great topic. Uh, but before I get into the conversation that I want to start with you, uh, basically, I want to ask you first, tell me a little bit more about yourself and how did you even begin this entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, so it probably goes back to childhood. I grew up and my mother suffered from bipolar disorder and I really learned young how to communicate, how to communicate in a neutral pattern. So sometimes people get on real high highs, real low loads. And often we have allow our egos to fall into that. We get upset with the person, we blame them, we create animosity. And I kind of learned how to remove my ego from the equation and meet someone where they're at. And, mm-hmm. and I think that ultimately the problem with that was my, nobody, we really didn't figure out what was going on with my mother until my twenties, because back then it was like, if there was something wrong with you, you just, you were supposed to just close your eyes and pretend like nothing's going on because right. back then mental health didn't exist. You were just stupid mm-hmm. and, and you had a horrible label and, and things were wrong with you. If you said anything was going on. So we didn't figure out what was going on until my twenties. And that ultimately led me into a med school pathway. And uh, I got a little disenfranchised on that side of things as well. So, and the problem was, I felt like my life was basically looking at a book, providing medication and sending someone on their mm-hmm. way. And it's not a shot at doctors, it's a system. That's mm-hmm. what you have to do. You don't have to follow through. I can't tell someone to eat an apple because they're not going to eat an apple. And I'll probably get sued for telling someone to eat an apple. So you have to provide medication to put a bandaid on most situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds like it was a frustrating, frustrating situation. Um, But I think we can always look back and see how it led us on our path. So that, you know, frustration led you into something else, which now you're helping entrepreneurs through your compassion conversations. And so I want to get into this topic today of how to not be salesy when we're talking about sales. And I know you have a three-step strategy to sell the high-end services. So why don't we talk about those steps first? Yeah. So basically the, the first business we had was the health, a healthcare business. So we help people in mental health, social health, sleep, nutrition, fitness, and habits. And this is when I got really frustrated with sales because a lot of sales trainers were telling me you need to stab someone with the knife. You need to, mm. if they cry, they buy if objections, the call doesn't start till objections. And I felt like being in a sort of a healthcare business, my good job was to make people better, but now I was trying mm-hmm. to manipulate people to make a decision. So I was living this lie and I, I felt completely disingenuous and, and like I didn't have integrity in what I was doing. So that's when I looked at what we were doing in the mental health side of things. And I took the idea of a psychotherapeutic conversation. So think cognitive behavior therapy, motivational interviewing, acceptance, commitment therapy, and some trauma and recovery ideas and move those into a sales process. 
Mm. And that's how we came up with these three pillars and the three fundamental tenets. Number one is detaching from the need to sell. And the best way to think about this is even if you need the money right now, if you chase someone, they're going to run away. Think about mm-hmm. dating. If you meet someone new and you're like texting them all the time and you're like, I, right. you won't stop communicating with them. You're now needy. And guess what? They don't want to be as involved with you anymore. So Mm -hmm. we have to do the same thing in a sales conversation. We have to detach from wanting it so much and move into a position to where we are basically here to serve. And Mm -hmm. ultimately it puts us in a place to where if you don't seem like you want it that bad, the other person's going to want it more. They're like, why is this this dummy not trying to sell me? What's wrong with Chandler? And I call it the smart dummy concept because they're like, oh, he's just, he's trying, he's cute, whatever. He's, he's just... He's not a good salesperson. That's what you want because that drops that sales resistance and puts you in a Mm -hmm. position to where they can finally open up and confide in you and and trust in your leadership. Right. Well, and I think, and I know you've got a couple other tips, you know, to talk about, but I think on that one, ideally you are trying to find if they're the right fit for you, because if you're not going to be the right fit for them, they're not going to be happy with you anyway. So even if you're pushing them into a sale, then you're going to end up with a dissatisfied customer. So I think ideally just having a conversation and trying to serve, if that's what you have is really going to help them. Like that really is the goal, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's comes into our, our third tenant and we'll go over number two in a second, but the third tenant is the art of, of becoming a challenging leader. And the mm-hmm. idea behind that is imagine this. So you, you walk into a therapist's office and they tell you, you're going to be fixed. I'm going to fix you today. You're going to walk away with your problem solved. You're going to be like, the therapist is ridiculous. What is wrong with this person? This is how we have to approach sales. People come into a sales mm-hmm. conversation. They're like, do you want to buy this? What can I do to get you to buy today? Uh, are, are you ready? Can I take your money? And so we have to get out of that and move into being able to challenge someone appropriately and empathetically. And so if someone says, you know, well, maybe I don't know. I need to ask questions. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? Uh, does what I said make sense to you? Yes. Well, why though? Why does it make sense to you? Why are you ready to do this right now? Why not wait? Why not just mm-hmm. not do anything? On a scale of one to 10, where you're at, I'm a seven. Wow, why not lower? Why, why, why so high? I'm ultimately challenging whether or not they're ready to commit to something and I'm challenging their coachability. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll often ask people about finan- finances really early in the conversation. And, and we take all objections and move them into discovery. So it's not a problem at the end, but a lot of people won't ask about money. And right. in reality, it's one of the most important things we can ask about. So that's a challenge. If someone doesn't want to talk, a prospect doesn't want to talk about money, they're not going to be able to talk about the hard things when they're being coached as well. So this is an interview at the same time. Right. It's very, very thought thought provoking on that too. Right. You know, like by trying to basically almost convince them not to like, when you're like, well, you're at seven, why not lower? You know, it's like almost telling them you're not ready for my service. Right. (laughs) That's the anti-sale and people will be at the end of the conversation. They'll be, I'll be like, so that's all I have. What do you want to do from here? Can I buy this thing? well, I don't know. Do you really want it? Are you sure you should do it right now? And then Mm -hmm. they're like, what is wrong with this guy? He won't even try to, he won't take my money. And and so ultimately you've interviewed them to a point to where they're selling themselves. And that's what we Mm -hmm. want. Because then when Mm -hmm. someone sells themselves and says yes to themselves, that puts them in a position and a place to where they're not going to ask for refunds. There's not going to be buyer's remorse. They're going to be happy about their decision. And that's what we want. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let's go back then to number two and talk about that tenant. Yeah. So number two is arguably one of the most important ones we have, and that's achieve level five listening. And so when you think about the idea of level five listening, level one is basically ignoring, like you're talking Mm. and I'm just off, I'm off in outer space, not paying attention to you. Number two is I'm pretending to listen. And that's like, I pull out my phone and you're talking to me, but I'm on Instagram and I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. That, yeah. uh Uh-huh. Literally not paying attention to anything you're saying, but I'm pretending like I am. Right. Level three is I'm only listening to be able to respond. And a Mm. good example of this is someone's talking to you and they're talking, but all you can do is think about how to formulate what you're going to say next. You have no idea what they're saying. You're only worried about your response. Another good example of this is politics. Someone says something about liberals, something conservatives. You have, you don't have no idea what they said. Don't even care what their thought is. It's just, this is my viewpoint. You suck. And so that's kind of level, level three, level four is I'm attentive. I'm paying attention. I'm asking questions, going back and forth, but I'm still inside of my own ego. And I'm inside of my own model of the world. And I haven't really stepped into your thoughts and your ideas and how you could potentially be right, how this happened and how that happened. And that's when we move into level four, level five, which is empathetic listening. And that's when I've stepped out of my own ego. I recognize that there's no real right or wrong. There's no real yes or no. 
there is only the model of the world that we develop as we grow up and as we experience life through childhood and adulthood and everything that we go through. And so I step out of my own ego and I step inside of yours so I can define and understand your model of the world. I can connect the dots to your pain, but then move your pain to your past, identify the triggers along the way, and ultimately help you recognize that the failure point isn't here. It's something radically different over here that's been happening for 10, 20, 30 years or how, however long it's been going on. And that's mm-hmm. how we help someone recognize the extent of the issue and the real problem at hand. Right. And if you're really listening, then you might hear something that they're not exactly saying, right? But then you know the next question to ask as well, right? Like you kind of, you're cued into like that deeper level. Exactly. And it's like, let's let's take weight loss, for example. Someone says, I want to lose weight. Like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's great. But why do you want to lose weight? I want to look good at the beach. Yeah, me too. I want to look great in a bikini. Why does that matter though? Why would you want to look good in a bikini? Ah, because I'm embarrassed. I'm getting deeper. Why are you embarrassed? Well, because I think people are judging me. Why would they judge me? Why would they judge you? Because I think I look disgusting. Well, why do you think you would look disgusting? Well, because I, I have this and that. I've, do, I've gone from, I want to lose weight to deep internal insecurity. And when you think about mm-hmm. lead gen, same thing. Why do you want to generate leads so I can grow my business? Why do you want to grow your business so I can feed my family? Why does that matter? Because I don't want my kids to be homeless and on the street. I want them to have a good right. life and I'm worried I'm going to lose everything. These are the problems we need to get to. Okay, well, how long has this been happening? 10 years. What happens if this continues going on? So we help them understand and identify the timeline that's happening because people don't understand right. that they make repeated attempts at failure and they just keep mm. doing the same thing over and over again. And by Einstein's definition, that's insanity. Right. Exactly. Well, and I think like you're saying, you're getting down to that core issue, which If that core issue is what's driving them to need their service and they're feeling that pain, then that's where they're going to see like, yes, you have something that I need. So again, it's not like you're really selling them, you're showing them a solution. Exactly. And then when you get to the pitch, if you've already asked these questions, if you've identified this core belief or this internal desire, this real problem, then you move to the pitch and it's not hey, I'm going to do this, this, and this for you. How does that sound? It's like, Mm -hmm. hey, because you said that you hate who you see in the mirror, what we're going to do is what I call the brain code rewire. Because you said that you you wanted to do this, what we're going to do is what I call this. And because you said that, we're going to add support, heart-centered support, because you said you can't really do this on your own. So with everything that they said they needed and wanted, you can include as part of what you're doing. One of the biggest problems I see with people pitching is they try to pitch like everything in the kitchen sink. It's like a click funnel webinar. I'm going to give you this water bottle. I'm going to give you a pair of AirPods. I'm going to give you this, this, that, and all of it's worth $970 million. But then people are like, okay, I, I don't need all those things. I need to think about it. You just overwhelmed them. It's the paradox of choice. Give me too many things and I will choose nothing. Right. Right. I've heard that too. I've heard really like ideally maybe three options is what is good. You know, maybe like an entry level, like kind of mid and then like that premium. So what do you think about like that, that number of options? Yeah. So I think for me, we give them one option and it's exactly Mm. what they need. No more, no less. Three options going to be, I need to think about it because I don't know which one I want to pick. So what, Mm -hmm. what we do is we uncover finances and discovery. We uncover what's going on with like a spouse. We uncover what's going on with uncertainty. Then when we move to pitch, Hey, because you said this, we're going to do that because you said that we're going to do this because your finances look like this, this, uh, platform or program or price or whatever is going to make the most sense for you. How does that sound? Well, that sounds great because it's legitimately everything I need and it fits in my budget. So mm-hmm. ultimately for us, we want it to be an ironclad solution that fits their specific problems and needs and doesn't give right. them 85 things to think about. Right. So someone's listening then and saying like, okay, I get the concept. I know I don't want to be pushy. I don't want to be salesy. I only want to, you know, have the clients who really see the need for my service. And I don't want to push them into it. Even if I know they need it, if they're not ready for it, however, I'm starting my business or things have been tough, you know, cash is a little bit tight. So I really need a sale. Like, what would you say to that person? Yeah, I'd say, number one, take the pressure off yourself, because the more pressure you put on yourself, the more you're going to want it, the more the other person can smell it, the less likely Mm -hmm. it is they'll buy. So move yourself into a place where you can enter the conversation and just ask questions to uncover what's really going on, and then pitch specifically what they need. Just Mm -hmm. simplify your process. And what we do inside of our Compassion Conversations Academy is we go through this nine-step framework. So we take what seems like a simple three-step process, but we help you achieve mastery and accelerate results. And ultimately, I think that's what uh, like a business, a business owner who's struggling needs because if you're booking 10 calls and you're only closing one of them a month, you're on the fast track mm-hmm. to bankruptcy. 
But if you can accelerate that time uh, domain and move to enrolling three people, well, now you've just tripled your revenue and you're on the fast track right. to actual growth. And so I think if you're a business owner in that domain, what you need to do is take that pressure off yourself and, and move yourself to a position to where you ask good questions, you be yourself, you be genuine, and you ultimately work to pitch what's exactly and specifically going to work for that human being you're talking to. Mm -hmm. So I know earlier too, you were talking about you don't have objections come at the end because you're having this conversation and you're kind of weaving it into that conversation as it's happening, you know, but how can somebody, maybe they're not even quite as experienced at this, you know, and they're maybe not overcoming objections as they're happening and things are, you know, kind of happening at the end. So how can you help them give them maybe a couple steps of how to change that around so they don't have a conversation. And at the very end, all of a sudden, there are all these object objections. Yeah. So first step, go back and listen to your calls if you're not if you're recording them. If you're not recording them, then start recording them. If you've been on a bunch of calls or been, been in a bunch of sales situations and you know what your objections are, take those, write them out, and then move them to fit into discovery. So when we teach discovery, we teach two phases. So phase one is questioner, being a level five listener, really identifying what's going on. Phase two is becoming a challenging leader, removing uncertainty, asking those questions, moving to elicit doubt. Why do you need this? Why do you think you even need this? Why Why not later? Why right now? Oh, you're a 10. Why not, why not a three? Then we move to spouse. We need to identify, hey, is there anyone else who is involved in this? Not because I, I care about them getting on, on this call or, or whatever, but because I care about being in alignment. If your partner mm -hmm. doesn't know what's going on, well, guess what? They can't be supportive. And that's the reason people fail. They have a partner who's oblivious, who doesn't know what's happening, and they won't respect the process. Mm -hmm. And then we move into finances. We, in our process, we teach people how to uncover basically every dollar someone makes and to do it ethically and, and feel good about it. And this is a point of contention sometimes because people are afraid to talk about money. And my mm -hmm. philosophy on this is if you can't talk about money and you can't have these hard conversations, probably aren't in the best position to be coaching people. And right. so you kind of have to get past your own insecurities and say, hey, if I talk about money, I can pitch them exactly what they need at a price point that specifically fits their budget. And I can change this person's life. Mm -hmm. So what about the situation where maybe again, it's a partnership or a husband and wife team, or maybe it's a family and, you know, the dad is having the meeting with you, but there's, you know, someone else like child involved and, and maybe they're not in that meeting and they're like, oh, well, I do have to like go back and have a conversation, which is still kind of an objection. Like, how do you work through that where you don't have everyone who's a decision maker on that call with you? Yeah. So you move that to discovery before you even get into the pitch or, or price or anything like that. You start talking about what I call alignment and it's, mm -hmm. Hey, I want to make sure that, that we're all in alignment. So it, it's me. And you mentioned your son, you mentioned your wife, you mentioned your business partner. Do they even know you're on this call or, or are you kind of just doing this on your own? Oh, I'm doing it on my own. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you think they will be supportive? Uh, oh yeah, of course. Well, can I challenge you on that real quick? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Do you think they can actually be supportive if they have no idea what's happening. Mm -hmm. Weight loss example. Say your husband comes home. He says, yeah, do the program, do whatever you want. But then he comes home and he brings Taco Bell. He brings pizza home all the time. What are you going to do? You're going to eat the pizza. Then what's going right. to happen? You're going to fail. Or business example. Let's say you're, you, you, you jump onto a program. You're, you're going to run Facebook ads. You have to spend money on those ads. Your partner doesn't want to spend that money. You're going to fail the program. Mm -hmm. So if not every party is in alignment here, then there's no hope of being successful. And for me, mm -hmm. I'm not willing to bet on your failure. Mm -hmm. So in order to effectively see if we're all in alignment, I think all parties need to be here to discuss this to move forward. So when I put it in that way, it's in their best interest. I'm telling them right. I'm not willing to bet on their failure. I'm not telling them I need him to be on here to pitch you guys. I'm telling right. them, hey, I need all of us to be in alignment because if someone else is oblivious, you're going to fail. And I'm not willing to take your money and bet on your own failure. Mm -hmm. So in that case, then if you're on this meeting and someone else should be there and, you know, I would think if they probably weren't aware they were even in that conversation, they're not going to be able to hop on that meeting right then. So you would just say, let's reschedule this when we can all be on the call at the same time, I'm assuming. Yeah. So then we, we say, Hey, and so to make sure we're all in alignment, let's, let's move this to another call tomorrow, next week, whatever it takes. I'm not big on pushing people to make a call like 24, seven, 27, <laughs> six seconds later because that's right. sort of pushing people to make a decision. So it's like, you put the ball in their court, like, hey, if you really want this, and if your partner is really committed to your own success, and if you're committed to your success, 
then let's figure out a time that works. Mm-hmm. Are you open to, to checking out your calendar? And, and let's see if we can figure out something that makes sense. Right. So if having these compassionate conversations is ideally what we want to be doing, why are there so many people who are still out there who are pushy and aggressive and think that's the way to do sales? Yeah, because that's the old way. The old model of sales is basically get on a million calls, push as many people as humanly possible to make a decision, make a bunch of people angry, get a few enrollments, get even more refund requests, get used Mm -hmm. to rejection and do it over again. It's like the cold calling, uh, door knocking method of of sales from the 80s, like Glenn Gary Ross, brass balls, always be closing. I drive a Mercedes Benz. And I think we're moving into a, a place to where consumers and prospects don't want to be sold that way. So now mm-hmm. we're starting to see people get on calls with this huge amount of sales resistance, like a, ma- like a brick wall of sales resistance. And that's why we need to move into this new model of sale- selling to where we get on the call, we're detached, we're not asking them for the sale, we're not being aggressive to get that sale. We're moving to identify the real problem, connect the dots to the past, remove move the failure point from what they think it is to the real problem, and being a challenging leader to be able to essentially drive the right people in for your service and remove the wrong people. It puts us in this position where we establish a few things. We create the know, like, and trust factor. Now they know Mm -hmm. me now. They like me because of the experience and they start to trust me. And that removes fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So if they're not fearful of what's going on anymore, that's step one. If they're not uncertain about whether I can solve their problem, that's step two. And if they're no longer doubtful of the outcome, they're going to enroll in anything I want because now they, they trust me. They have that know, like, and trust factor. Right. And then it comes back to, again, you're looking for the best solution for them. You're not trying to just make a sale. Exactly. And that's why we pitch a specific solution. And Mm -hmm. it can be your normal offer. You just put pitch specifically what's going to help that person, because that's what you know is going to help that person. And then ethically, if you realize that you're not probably the best fit for this, and you're unsure of yourself, you tell them that you can't help them. And then in your back pocket, you have someone to refer them to. So you provide a continual good experience, even post call, if you can't help. Right. I think that's important too, because a lot of times people are afraid to have relationships with people that are in their same industry because they think, oh, it's competition, you know, and they might, you know, go after the customers that I have, but realizing that you're resources for each other, because we don't all serve the same people. Someone is going to come to me at some point that is not ideal. And I can pass them on, you know, to someone else who is a better fit. Right. So how would you help someone kind of overcome that fear of, having someone else in their same industry as a resource. Yeah. It's like, Hey, how many people are in this world? Billions. How many people are in your industry? Most people have no idea. Let's say there's 17 million. There's there's 30 million people in your industry. Can you serve all 30 million of those people? (laughs) No. (laughs) Then why do you think you need to hog all of the people? And guess what? Here's the cool factor. You can make friends and friends Mm -hmm. are really cool. Because what happens with friends is they'll refer to you, you refer to them, and then you create a referral pattern and a referral strategy through strategic partnerships where you could be getting three to five new clients a month from that person where, and you didn't pay for any marketing. You didn't do anything other than create a friendship and a partnership. Mm -hmm. And so you have to first recognize you can't help and serve everybody. And secondly, recognize you have your strengths and other people have their strengths. And if you can play to yours and give other people over there who have better strengths than you on, on other sides of things, you can create a really cool dynamic and dichotomy to where now you don't need to run millions of dollars in Facebook ads. You don't need to run millions of dollars in front end marketing because you have so much coming in through strategic partnerships. And I I think Mm -hmm. people don't do this enough because they're so insecure with the ability to refer out. They want to try to help everyone, but ultimately when you try to help everyone, you don't really help anyone. Mm -hmm, That's so true. So let's touch on how selling maybe high ticket items is different than low, you know, entry level products or services and your approach for that. Yeah. When you're selling lower, high, lower entry level services and products, you can, if it's less than like a thousand dollars, you can sell it off a webinar. You can sell it off of a Facebook live. You can literally sell it in Facebook messenger if you want to, depending on Mm -hmm. what your business model is. So it's not as challenging of a sale because there's not as much to lose for the prospect. Like if Mm -hmm. I'm on a phone call and selling a $500 product, no, they don't really care as much. It's not a huge loss. But when you're moving into a higher end service, then you have to recognize and understand that they have a lot to lose on the table. If your product's $5,000, $10,000, 
this person's going to come in with an incredible amount of fear associated with buying this thing because they're about to spend a lot of money. That, that's a big purchase for people. That's almost as much as buying a car. And, and so when you look at that, you have to move into the idea of challenging their fear and their uncertainty and kind of being an emotional animal with them by stepping into their model of the world and ultimately leading them to recognize points of failure and, and achieve. And you'll, you'll be achieving that level five listening by moving someone from problem here to real problem here. And so we ultimately right. have to move them from emotion to logic, back to emotion, back to logic to help them recognize and understand I'm making a purchasing decision. I like the purchasing decision. I don't want a refund at the end of this. I won't have buyer's remorse. And this person can actually help me. Mm -hmm. I think too, just having those high end sales, a lot of times too, it is scarier for, you know, the business owner to present that, you know, again, it's a bigger ticket item. And, you know, again, especially if they're needing cash, it becomes more nerve wracking for them to have that conversation than the entry level service, you know, here's my course, or, you know, here's this lower end product, you know, that is going to get you started on something, but not really what they want. So I don't know if there's any tips that you could share with them too, about how to just feel comfortable with the whole process. Yeah. I think about it this way. If I have to sell a $500 course to make ends meet, or I can sell a $10,000 program, it's going to be a lot easier to take 10 calls and sell one 10K program than to try to sell a bunch of those 500s to get near that 10K. So the volume I'm going to have to produce is going to be significantly less because by definition, if you do enough calls, you're eventually someone's going to say yes to you. And so I think that's the first step. The second step is recognizing, and this is big for me, is your client success rate with the $500 course is going to be like 3% if you're lucky because you can't mm -hmm. provide the support to them that you can with a $10,000 service. So if I provide a $10,000 service, I can actually coach. I can actually hire people to support. I can give them like messaging opportunities. They can submit their work and I can follow them around the internet to make sure they're successful. <laughs> and ultimately for me, that leads to like a 98% success rate or higher. And that's what I want. Mm -hmm. Instead of working on, on a program that I don't have a high success rate, I can try to get volume. I can work on a program to where I can have lower volume, but a massive success rate and more profitability. It puts me in a much better position long-term. Right. That's so true. And I think just, we have to get over our fears of those conversations. I think again, kind of sales, a lot of times people are afraid of that word. And like I said, maybe part of it is associated with that negative connotation of a salesperson. And I think what you're sharing is really important for them to realize, again, you don't have to be pushy. You don't have to try to sell something that's not ideal for them. It's really just having that conversation, really listening, finding out, you know, what is the best solution for them and presenting it to them to give them that option. Exactly. And take the pressure off yourself. Stop reading scripts. Stop going to the watching Boiler Room or, or any of these shows that show this like brass balls closing concept and move into this idea that you can be yourself. And when you start being yourself on the call and you just ask good questions consistently and repeatedly and you listen, people will be a lot more likely to want to participate in what you're doing because they start to believe you. They start to trust you. They start to say, okay, this guy's not just here to sell me. He's not just another salesman. And they'll right. start buying or they'll stop purchasing exactly what you're offering. And I think the other thing to think about too, is if you're worried about pitching higher end services, or you're worried about people buying it, a lot of the time that isn't necessarily the prospects worry. That's our mm -hmm. own worry. That's mm -hmm. us thinking with our own wallet. Like, would I buy right. this thing? Do I have confidence to buy this? I don't know if I can pitch this. Well, well, guess what? This is your own insecurity. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most important things to do is work on our own insecurities to uh, remove them, or at least to learn how to spot the trigger and work past them and make right. it a non-issue anymore. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important thing to point out. And hopefully those who are listening are going to be able to really think about that and say, this is why I'm having a challenge is really, it's about me, <laughs> you know, and being able to move forward with that. So that was a fabulous tip even right there. Uh, but I know we're running short on time. So I did want to ask if you have an offer that you would like to share with our listeners. Yeah, for sure. So I eat my own dog food and I try to build the relationship and the no like and trust factors. So what I, what I like to give out to everybody who's listening is our, our entire nine step framework to creating compassion conversations. So the nine steps it requires to install those three pillars we talked about earlier. If you want to mm -hmm. get that, just go to nine step dot culture of care dot life. That's the number nine step dot culture of care dot life, not dot com. 
-hmm. And if you're interested in doing that, you'll just basically enter your name, email, phone number. It'll redirect you to my Facebook group. And there's like 9,000 videos in there where you could it's literally better than most $10,000 courses all for free inside that group. And then we do a free training once a week in there. So you're not only getting the nine step framework, you're getting a bunch of other exciting stuff in there. You can consume and really take your sales journey by storm. Perfect. And uh, we'll put everything that was provided to us in show notes too. So if anyone wants to find that, they can look in there and click on that. It'll be easier than having to type that. So we'll make sure we have everything in the show notes. Um, and if someone wants to connect with you, besides the link that you just shared, how can they find you? Yeah, just go to Instagram, instagram.com forward slash Chandler underscore SAF. You'll see me. It's like me and a surfboard, my little three-year-old daughter, and I'll, I'll, a lot of this, it's like a mixture of family and fun stuff. So you'll know it's me. Just there's a man bun in there. It, it's exciting. <laughs> it's flowery. So go to the Instagram and check me out. If you want to connect on Facebook, you can go to facebook.com forward slash Chandler SAF, same profile picture in there. Connect, hit me up, ask me any questions. I'm a, an approachable guy and here to create a culture of care. Perfect. Well, I think that's true. The approachable, just having the conversation with you today and the, the way that it's gone, you know, it's definitely an easy conversation. So I'm sure that listeners will want to reach out to you and get those resources that you have. So thank you so much, Chandler. I appreciate your being a guest today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Hopefully we gave everybody, everybody a bunch of value and they're ready to take over the world and enjoy <laughs> sales rather than dreading it. I hope so. <laughs> so, and I want to thank the listener as well. Thank you for tuning in to this episode today. I hope you found this topic interesting and then answered some of your questions about how to sell high-end services without manipulation, aggressive tactics, or feeling salesy. If you have any additional questions or comments, be sure to reach out to Chandler or you can send us a message at media at abandp.com. And would you please share our show information with those you know? I'd greatly appreciate your support. I hope you can join us for next week's topic, Marketing for Small Business Owners. And please remember, you can connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And my website is abandp.com. You can also find us posted on multiple favorite podcast platforms, including iTunes, Google, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening to Biz Help For You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next Tuesday. Have a terrific week.